Hello, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, everyone who is joining today's live Q&A on COVID-19. I am very pleased to be joined today again with doc, uh, by Dr. Maria Van Kerkhoff, our technical lead for COVID-19. Good afternoon, Maria. Hi, Alex. Thank you again for, for your time today. Um, I, would, I would remind our viewers, if you're watching us on Twitter, to ask your question using the hashtag AskWHO. If you're watching us on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube, um, ask your questions via comment section. Um, today, we, we don't have just a specific focus. Uh, we are talking overall about COVID-19 situation, epidemiological situation, variants, um, and any other question you may have. So uh, feel free to ask. Um, Maria, as as while we're waiting for, for viewers to, to, to send their questions, maybe maybe you can tell us where are the, the transmission hotspots at the moment, as we know that the Delta variant is, is spreading around the world very fast. Yeah, so thanks, Alex, for, for having me. So we give a, a snapshot at the global level. Um, we have increased, there's about the same number of cases that were reported this week than last week. Um, slightly higher actually, almost four and a half million cases were reported worldwide uh, to WHO and more than 68,000 people died last week. Um, we have hot spots in all regions. I mean, I think you've heard me say many times that this is a very dynamic situation. Um, and we have some countries that you know are really getting a handle over transmission uh, while others are really seeing widespread transmission. Um, in the Americas, we saw an eight percent increase in cases in the last seven days and a 10 percent increase in deaths. Um, the highest number of new cases reported last week were in the U.S. with more than a million cases reported um, in Iran, um, although there was a decrease in cases since the last week. In India, although there was a decrease in cases since last week, the U.K., which had an increase in cases, and in Brazil. Um, and there are hot spots all over. And I think one of the things we're really trying to do is get a better handle on why this is happening. Um, I, you know, you've heard me say a lot about four major factors that are driving transmission globally. One is the Delta variant that you mentioned. With increased transmissibility, you will have increased numbers of cases, which will result in increased numbers of hospitalization. That could put a burden on the healthcare system, and that can result in increased numbers of people dying. This is in the context of people, you know, who are not vaccinated. You know, much of the world remains unvaccinated. Um, because we do not have equitable distribution of vaccine worldwide. We have not vaccinated those most at risk, people with underlying conditions, people of advanced age. And unfortunately, people are dying because they don't have access to the vaccine. Third condition is that we have increased social mixing and social mobility. The more contacts you have means the more potential exposure you can have to this virus. And the fourth factor is the inconsistent use of public health and social measures mask wearing, hand hygiene, physical distancing, good ventilation. Um, but I wanna add a fifth factor this week, Alex. Um, it's something you've heard us talk quite a lot about, but it's misinformation and, and that's nothing new. Um, but I think, you know, I think in the last week, weeks, four weeks or so, the amount of misinformation that is out there seems to be getting worse. And I think that's really confusing for the general public. What do I do? You know, how do I keep myself safe? Um, and I, I, I fear uh, that this is another fifth element that we have now, fifth factor, that is really allowing the virus to thrive. Thank you, Maria. And, and indeed, it is confusing. And, and we are seeing people uh, uh, around the world in many situations or all around us where, where we go in different, in different places that um, at least I get the impression that um, people are doubting the measures that we have, uh, yeah. masks vaccines, um, why do I keep the distance, for how long I need to keep the distance. So I we, we may, I mean, we understand the fatigue, but we may see as well that some people are giving up on doing what we need to do. So is it a time to give up or we need to keep going? We have to keep going. I mean, this is not the time to give up. Um, it's not the time to give up anywhere at um, any reaches of the planet. There's so much that we can do to control transmission, including the Delta variant. Um, vaccines and vaccination are the latest um, incredibly powerful tool that we have that save lives. I, I get asked a lot, why should I get the vaccine? Because it will save your life. 
if you get the vaccine, if you get the full doses of those vaccines, it can save your life. It can prevent you from developing severe disease and needing hospitalization, and it can save you, your life from dying from infection with, with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, but not everybody has access to that vaccine. And you know, while the vaccines are incredibly effective against severe disease and death, we have all of these other measures that also keep us safe and prevent the virus from spreading. And this is things that you can do um, quite simply of keeping your distance from others. I know that we want to be socially connected with others, but we can remain physically distant from them while still keeping that social connection. And I know how hard this is 20 months into a pandemic. Um, we all understand that, but it's about keeping your hands clean. It's about wearing a mask and making sure that you wear a mask over your nose and your mouth. It's, fi it's fitted properly. It has the right filtration. You can still breathe while wearing it. Um, you know, avoiding crowded spaces, especially indoors, because we know the virus could spread more easily indoors, especially where there's poor ventilation. Open the windows if you're indoor, have good cross ventilation of getting fresh air in, spend more time outdoors than indoors. But if you are spending time outdoors, also avoid crowds outdoors as well. Um, all of these measures are critically important in keeping us safe. And it's not just about you, it's about your loved ones. So what you do to keep yourself safe also helps you keep your loved ones safe. So it is absolutely not the time to give up. Uh, we should we should erase that from our memories and you know think about how we can continue to live our lives because of course we have to go to work. Um, you know we have to, to have groceries and feed our families, but keep ourselves safe throughout the day. We have this campaign of know your risk, lower your risk. So what is it that you have to do every day? Um, what are the things that you could postpone doing? And then how do you do that in the most safe, safe way possible? Thank you very much, Maria. Speaking of, of, of masks and, and measures, you, you explained we need to have a well-fitted mask to actually maximize the protection or maximize the benefit of, of that tool. A few of our viewers are actually asking, do we have any data that show effectiveness of face shields and, and do we recommend them to be used? So that's a really good question. So our recommendations are very strong on masks. We continue to advise the use of masks, even if you're vac vaccinated, because we know some individuals can get infected while being vaccinated and potentially spread the virus to others. So until we have a full picture on that, we advise on wearing masks. Face shields offer a different kind of protection. Our recommendation is for, for medical professionals um, to wear masks and to wear respirators, um, but for the general public to wear either a medical mask if you are uh, have underlying conditions or of, a, of an older age, so above 60, um, but to wear a fabric mask if you are under, under, that, under uh, 60, if you don't have underlying conditions. But the fabric masks need to be three layers is what we recommend. It's all about fit, filtration, and breathability. And so the masks offer that barrier. So if you're infected um, to pass droplets and aerosols to others, that mask provides a barrier. The face shield provides an immediate barrier for those droplets, but the, obviously, you know, the, the aerosols can, can spread around that. So our recommendation is for the masks. However, there are certain populations that a, that a face shield would be better. Thank you, Maria. Uh, here's one question coming from Robin Bachon. Uh, again, around mask, are N95 masks recommended over cloth mask to protect ourselves from the Delta variant? So we recommend the use of respirators for health workers um, in areas, you know, where they're doing these aerosol generating procedures, where they're just to make sure that they're they're well protected. But an N95 mask or respirator, FFP2, FFP3, it depends on where you live, what they're called. They have to be fit tested, which means they have to go over your nose and mouth and fit appropriately. You know, if you have facial hair or if there are gaps in them, they don't work. Um, and so I do see a lot of people in the general public wearing um, an N95 mask, but they're not worn quite appropriately. So if you choose to wear one, make sure that they're fit tested. Um, they're made for adults, um, you know, in terms of the sizing, um, but it's all about whatever you put over your face to protect yourself, make sure that there's a good fit. If you have lots of gaps in them, they're not gonna, they're not gonna perform as well as they're intended to perform. Thank you very much, Maria, for clarifying this. Uh, I think it's it's very important, especially as, as we are trying to raise that it's important to wear a mask 
even if you're vac we got our vaccines, uh, but we need to do it properly and to, to use the right mask for, for that's fitting to our face. Um, you mentioned as well the lack of some people don't have, I mean, many people around the world, they don't have access to vaccines. And we know that African continent is the one with the least access to vaccine and also to some other life-saving tools when it comes to COVID-19. So maybe just um, as well, what's the situation in Africa at the moment? Do we have any improvement since, since last week? So th this is a good question. I'm looking at the latest numbers that we have here. We have seen there are about 150,000 cases reported from the African continent. It's a big continent, many, many different countries um, in the last seven days. That's about a 3% decline. Um, and we've had about an 11% decline in deaths reported in the last week. But we do know across the continent, um, there is less access to testing, um, to the tests themselves. Um, to um, supplies, but personal protective equipment, like we've been, just been talking about masks and respirators and equipment that medical professionals need, um, goggles, um, gloves, you know, to be able to care for uh, COVID-19 patients and patients suffering from other diseases. Um, there's less access to oxygen and there's certainly less access to the vaccine. And one of the things, you know, we're, we're advocating and working towards better access better delivery, better use of all of those materials across the continent. We're working with our regional office, the African regional office and Africa CDC and many partners in countries to be able to do that uh, with many partners as well. Um, but I just wanna touch upon uh, the vaccine, access to the vaccine. You know, there's a lot of news lately about boosters um, or, you know, in receiving third doses for people who've already uh, received their first and second doses. And this is really causing some challenges. I mean, there's there's no sugar coating of saying this. We need people in all countries to receive their first and second doses, especially those who have underlying conditions. The goal of the vaccine is to prevent severe disease and death. This is what they work. This is how they work. This is what they intend to do. And we need people across the continent of Africa who have underlying conditions, who are over 60, who work on the front lines to receive their first and second doses before others receive that third booster dose because they're already protected. And the vaccines are working very, very well against severe disease and death, including against the Delta variant. And I think that's really important because even though, you know, others, you know, I, I'm, and I'm not saying, I'm not talking about those individuals who need that third dose, like immunocompromised patients. That's not what we're talking about. I'm talking about mass use of the third dose or a booster for people who are already well protected. We live in a global world. I mean, it's obvious to say we need global solutions for a global problem. We will not solve this problem at a national level. And I just want to make one other point. The idea that we can protect one population fully without protecting the rest of the world is a false sense of security because we have these variants that are emerging. We have a completely interconnected world and, and many people are traveling right now. And viruses travel in people. So we're moving the virus around and we can see that through a lot of the genetic sequencing work. Um, There's some beautiful work that was done looking last summer in the Northern hemisphere. And you can see how the virus was circulating through people traveling over the summer months in the Northern hemisphere. Um, and that will happen again. This is, this is not, you know, uh, a theoretical risk. It's a real risk that we're seeing right now. So the idea that you can fully protect one population without protecting the rest of the world is a false sense of security. The virus is evolving. It will continue to evolve. We will have more virus variants if we allow it to continue to circulate. So we need to protect the world. are most at risk first um, in all countries before we start giving these boosters in just a subset, um, in, you know, in some populations. Thank you, Maria. Um, there is a follow-up question on what you were explaining just before this uh, about masks. And um, one, I assume, parent is asking how to make sure that the mask is fitted to the child. Uh, mm -hmm. So maybe you can just remind on, on our recommendation for mask use for children. Yes. So our recommendations are we treat 12 and up like adults. 
um, in terms of the recommendation. So our recommendation for the use of 12, of 12 and up is in the area where you're living, if the virus is circulating, um, to wear a, a mask, uh, a fabric mask, a three layer fabric mask over your nose and mouth, well fitted, um, you know, where you cannot assure the physical distancing, where, you, where you're coming in contact with other people. And if you're indoors and you don't know, if you don't know if there's good ventilation, put on a mask, open the windows, but wear a mask indoors. For six, for the ages of six to 11, our recommendation is to take a risk-based approach. So depending on where you are, depending on how much virus is circulating, depending on the setting and how well you can help the child to wear that mask, um, it would it would be a context specific recommendation. Um, some uh, countries, some places are recommending masks for this age group, uh, but they, children do need to be taught how to wear a mask. My child, we teach him how to put on the mask safely, take off the mask safely, make sure that he does it with clean hands and make sure when he wears it, he doesn't wear it here or here or um, ill-fitting. Um, and it, and it's really about sort of behavior and teaching um, how to do that. We don't recommend the use of a mask for five and under. And this is for several different reasons. Part of it is for compliance. Um, just being able to have that age group wear a mask consistently and safely. Although I do know I have heard from many people that said, well, I can teach my, my kid to do that. that. That's fine. But children of that age need to be supervised, um, especially, especially the really, really young ones, because there is a risk of a choking hazard. Um, so you have to be really careful in that age group to make sure that they're monitored um, and supported in, in wearing that mask. But it's about behavior change. And, and a lot of us now, you know, we always have clean masks on hand. Um, we have our hand gel, you know, that we use. Um, we keep our hands clean and, 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 we, and we've, we've learned how to live with this. We've learned how to do this. It doesn't mean we're going to do this forever. Um, but I, you know, I think, I think the people have been very resilient in this space. Maria, there are a few more questions around children, uh, their risk um, of exposure to, to Delta variant, and also that in many places, uh, schools are about to be reopened uh, as the new year starts in, in September. So there are questions about what are the conditions that need to be met uh, before we reopen or, or in order to reopen the schools uh, safely. So this is a great question because, you know, there are still millions of children that are out of school. Um, and there are millions of children uh, that have not been in school for more than a year. And we all know the critical importance of, of school for kids, not just for education, but for their mental well-being, for their safety, their security. Um, and in many situations, this is where they receive food. I've, I've, I've said this over and over again. Um, but we have seen in many countries um, the safe reopening of schools and the staying open of schools. Um, our recommendations, you know, it, it's it's about controlling transmission in the community. Schools operate in communities. They're not isolated facilities. Um, the people who work in those facilities are people who live in the communities. And, uh, you know, so we have to start by controlling transmission in the communities. Um, where vaccination is offered, um, we recommend vaccination according to the priorities um, especially adults and the, you know those with those underlying conditions. And it's about schools having plans in place. So for example, um, you know, how would you identify a potential case in that school? What would the surveillance look like in that school and the contact tracing? How would you um, inform parents? Um, how do you inform and educate and listen to children in those schools so that they are part of that plan? Um, how do you ensure that you have the right environmental controls, disinfection, distancing in the, in the classrooms, um, less mixing among students? And I know that's very hard, especially with the younger, um, but the older kids, it's also about physical distancing and, and not congregating. Um, it's about good ventilation in schools. Um, and many, many schools around the world have figured out a way to open and stay open. And so this is really, really, really critical um, that we prioritize the opening of schools and that we prioritize all of our efforts in the community to keep those schools open. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, speaking of, of Delta variant spread and how it may be an impediment to 
reopen schools safely, but also do other activities safely. Um, Long one watching us on Facebook is asking, should we worry about Delta Plus variant? Which one is more concerned? So I would maybe ask here as well, are we seeing any new mutations and changes from the current Delta variant? So the virus continues to evolve. So we have the Delta variant that we are tracking globally. Um, and it's been reported in more than 140 countries worldwide. Um, and if it is not already, it is likely to become the dominant variant that is circulating. Um, but the virus does continue to evolve. And there are some sublineages that we're tracking. We don't use that phrase Delta Plus, um, but we do, we are looking, there are a bunch of scientific names for these variants and all of these mutations, which I won't go into here, which is why we're actually using the Greek alphabet. Um, but from I think from a public point of view, any SARS-CoV-2 virus that is circulating in your area, you should treat as a dangerous virus, regardless of what it is. But also know that you have some control over your exposure to that virus, whether it's Delta or whether it's another variant that may emerge. And I think that's what I want people to hear is that we are we are working with scientists around the world to track these mutations. Um, and there are several sublineages of Delta that we are looking at because the virus will continue to evolve. Unfortunately, the Delta variant will be the last variant you'll hear us talk about, but know that there are things that we can do to minimize its spread. Um, and this is about the public health and social measures. It's about what we do at an individual level measure level, what we do in communities. We stay home if we can work from home. Um, you know, we, a lot of people are still teleworking and that, and that's great. And that has a, a positive impact on, you know, as long as you can do that, but has a positive impact on the environment, but many people can't do that. So if we can stay home, you know, for those who have to go out and do their work, it, it puts less pressure on them. There are less people on public transportation. Um, we have to continue to wear our mask, um, you know, avoid those crowded spaces. And I would really, I think some people feel that this pandemic is over. And some people are acting like this pandemic is over. And I'm afraid it's far from over. It's not. So keep it up. You know, keep doing these individual level measures. I mean, a lot of it is a bit of an inconvenience, but it's what you can do to save your life and save the life of a loved one. So please, you know, we need everybody's help. We need everyone to play their part in this pandemic. We have an entire global army to fight and combat this virus. And I know I, I don't mean to use a war analogy on this, but we need to have that solidarity against this virus. Um, and we really need to do that. We need that global solidarity of the same drive and fight against this virus. And everyone has a role to play. Thank you so much, Maria. And also, we, we, we need this motivational energy um, to to keep up with 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 everything we are going through, as you as you rightly pointed, already for for twenty months, and it's been a loss for everyone. Um, yeah. We have a next question from Lisa Jamas Flores, uh, Flores asking, "What is known about the Lambda variant?" And one of our LinkedIn viewers was asking whether the Lambda variant is the new one that will be a problematic following the Delta variant. So thanks, Lisa, uh, for the question. Um, so the Lambda variant is one of the variants that we are tracking at a global level as a variant of interest. So this variant um, was first identified or first reported from Peru in December 2020, and it was classified by WHO at a global level as a variant of interest in June of 2021. Um, there are certain characteristics of this variant that make it of interest for us in terms of potential for increased transmissibility. So we're tracking it and sort of understanding what is happening in terms of its circulation. Um, we are dependent on our understanding of Lambda based on surveillance activities, sequencing and the sharing of those sequencing sequences um, to public uh, platforms like Jusade. Um, so this, is, this, this variant of interest has been reported in more than 40 countries. But in most of the reportings, it's only a few cases that have been reported with the Lambda variant. And our understanding of it is that in countries that did have a lot of Lambda circulation, um, that if the Delta variant is present, that the Delta variant overtakes it, meaning that the Lambda variant prevalence is declining and Delta is increasing. So it is one of the variants that we are looking at, um, we will continue to look at, 
Um, but the Delta variant seems to be out competing um, other variants that are circulating in, in other countries. So there are four variants of concern we're tracking, Alex. You know, the Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta. Delta um, is by far the most transmissible variant we've seen um, to date. Thank you so much, Maria. And um, it's not only that we as WHO are working with scientists on tracking the variants, surveillance and and tools to respond to the pandemic, but we're also working with, with different scientists around the world to um, find the origins of this COVID-19 virus. So maybe I'm, I'm using the chance now to ask you for an update on these efforts, um, but also why is it to explain to our viewers, why is it important as well to find out how it all started? And also about the new initiative with the scientific advisory group on origins of novel pathogens and how this will help us not only now, but in future. So thanks for thanks for bringing this up. So it's a good opportunity to remind everybody sort of why, why, why do we need to find the origins of SARS-CoV-2? Why do we need to better understand how this pandemic began? I mean, there's a real critical importance to understand how this pandemic began because we need to be better prepared for the next one. Um, and again, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but pathogens, viruses, you know, a lot of these types of viruses live in animals. They circulate in animals and wildlife populations. And some of them spill over or move between animals and humans. They call that a spillover event. And over the last 30 years or so, there have been many pathogens that have either become outbreaks or have been epidemics or turned into pandemics. We have um, SARS, you know, in 2002. There was MERS in 2012. Um, you have avian influenza. You have Lhasa, Nipah, Marburg, Ebola. Um, you have pandemic influenza. And the latest example is SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 virus. Um, and so for us, it's really important that we understand how this happens, you know, when this happens in terms of, you know, where the virus is. It's a coronavirus. So likely the origins are, is a bat. And so we need to study that. But the big question is, um, did this virus pass from a bat to an intermediate host, another animal species, before it started to infect humans? And so we need to understand that so that we can trace back that animal species and so that we can protect people from getting infected again and have good biosafety, biosecurity on farms. Um, but we also need to look at labs. You know, we need to look at biosafety and biosecurity of labs. And that's not about pointing fingers. It's not about pointing blame or even suggesting that, you know, one thing or another, but we have to look. And so we, as an organization, we work with um, our partners in the animal sector with FAO and OIE and UNEP. And we, we know the critical importance of One Health. I mean, many people have I'm sure have heard now of One Health. And this is about studying humans and animals and the environments that we work in and, and the environments that we live in um, to look at a comprehensive way in which we study these types of uh, origins. And so in the context of the threat of the emergence of new pathogens, WHO um, and the Director General um, has called for the establishment of this scientific advisory group on the origins of novel pathogens, or we're calling it SAGO. So on Thursday last week, on Friday last week, in fact, on the 20th, we, um, we released online um, and to our member states, the terms of reference for this new group. Um, and we outlined the call for applications. So it's an open call. And we are calling upon our scientific community, people with lots of diverse backgrounds in epidemiology and veterinary medicine, social science, biosafety, biosecurity, a wide range of, of expertise to apply to be part of this. And we hope, you know, that there's some continuity for those who've been on previous missions with us um, to look at origins of MERS and SARS. Already there was a, there was a group, uh, an excellent group of, of scientists that went on mission in January, 2021, as well as a group that went in February, 2020 to China. We hope many of them um, will be part of this group going forward. But it's really critically important that we understand the origins so that we are better prepared for the next one. Thank you so much, Maria, and uh, for explaining this. So we all understand better what is, what are the different parts of the work that we as WHO do and how we convene different scientists 
for the response, but also to prevent future um, epidemics to grow into, into pandemics, as you pointed already before in this conversation, that as, this, as Delta is not the last variant, this is also not the last novel pathogen and new virus, and also this is probably not the last pandemic that we as, as humans will, will will face. So we need to learn the lessons from the, the this experience. Um, re returning back to, to the response and the situation at the moment, um, one of our viewers was asking, are there now new tests for COVID-19 virus that actually tell you which variant you have? So there are a lot of new tests that are out. These are um, antigen-based uh, rapid tests. Um, and this is a really great addition to PCR tests that we have, the molecular tests that you have. And the rapid tests are good for a number of reasons. One is because um, you can get a result within 15, 30 minutes. Um, they're cheaper than the PCR test, which still remains our gold standard for testing. But antigen-based tests can also be used in a variety of different settings by trained individuals. So they can be done outside of a lab, they can be done outside of a medical facility and in more community type settings. Um, again, done by trained individual and of course, according to national laws that are in countries. We've worked with FIND to issue training on how to perform these antigen-based RDTs. And so there's a lot of these that are coming online. Um, some of them do not perform well. So you have to be careful about the one that you purchase, you know, and, and now I'm talking to governments about, you know, purchasing these antigen based RDTs. Um, but there are a lot of really good ones that are that are on the market. But I do also want to highlight that testing is absolutely it's absolutely critical that testing is linked to public health action. So just having a test done without actually linking it to, you know, early clinical care or isolation and contact tracing or, you know, it has to be linked to a public health action. More testing for testing's sake is not what we're out for. It's not about ticking a box about how many tests are done. It's about linking that um, result to caring for that individual and information sharing. Um, in terms of the ability to detect which variants you're infected with, this we rely on sequencing. So right now, um, what we do is in, in countries, a subset of the positive results are sequenced. We are actually working on with our partners to determine how much sequencing is enough. It's a very, very hard question to answer because it depends on your objective. Um, but in many countries, they've been working to increase their sequencing capacity to really understand, you know, one, which variants are circulating and two, is there anything changing? You know, are there any new variants that are circulating? So we're working with partners around the world with our regional platforms to enhance what already exists and expand that. Um, and there's lots of partners and there's lots of financing in this area, um, but also to identify where there are gaps um, because we don't have good eyes you know, around the world on, on all of these sequences. And so this is something that will take some time that will not only be beneficial for SARS-CoV-2, but for all infectious uh, viruses that are circulating right now. And I think I just wanna highlight, you said, Alex, um, which is a really good point. I mean. SARS-CoV-2 was our disease X, but the next disease X is out there. And so we want to be better prepared for that early detection. Sequencing will also help with this as well. The, the game, you know, has changed in that respect where once you have that full genome sequence, tests can be developed rapidly. And in the current pandemic, we within, within two weeks of learning of the cluster of pneumonia of unknown etiology, we worked with partners to publish the first PCR assay online. And this was done by Charity University in collaboration with several different institutions that validated that test. And within a couple of weeks after that, we were already producing tests to be shipped around the world. That didn't happen a couple of years ago. So this, this technology, I mean, technology is not really the problem. Technology is advancing. We just need to make sure that technology is, there's a more, um, democratic distribution of the technology, that it's not only in the hands of high income countries. And, and, and there's a lot of people that are working towards advancing that. Thank you, Maria. Um, speaking now about, about the tests again, while you were talking about lack of resources in Africa, one of our viewers was asking, is there a still a supply issue? Because at the beginning, there were no enough tests produced. Uh, but now as we are 20 months into pandemic, do we have 
enough tests or there is still a lack of on a production side or there is a lack of resources to buy enough tests in every country? I think I think it's both. Um, I mean, a lot of work has been done. Uh, we've been working with uh, partners to increase the, the supply chain and making sure that of those available tests, that those are um, prioritized for those who need it most. And we, we have a supply portal. We've been working with many partners and uh, I, I'm not going to name partners because I will forget some and I, and I don't mean to do that. Um, just a big shout out to everyone that we work with on, on the supply chain. Um, there is a production issue, um, you know, and there's a cost issue. So many of these tests are very expensive. Um, the antigen paste tests, the price is, is reduced, um, but still some of them are, are, qu are quite expensive. So it's about access, it's about price, it's about production. And then once these tests get into countries, it's about making sure that they can be used and that they're not wasted, that they don't expire, um, and that we have the right trained individuals to be able to use those tests and link that to the public health action. So it's a combination of factors um, that are there. I mean, bottom line, we need more production. We need more production of tests. We need in, in a variety of different countries. We need more production of vaccines in a variety of countries. We need those vaccines to be distributed and donated and shared um, again so that they can, you know, so people who need them um, receive them most first. Thank you so much, Maria. We got a couple of questions about treatment. Uh, I think one is more generic. We're talking about masks, vaccines, preventative measures. But then one of the viewers is asking, what, what is the treatment for COVID-19? And then there was a second question, a question more specific about the mild case of COVID. How do we treat it? And in that context, maybe, Maria, you can remind our viewers how to take care of someone at home uh, with the with the with the mild case, because we also know that in some countries where at the moment hospitals are overwhelmed, um, that patients need to be taken care of at home. Yeah, so that's actually a lot of questions in one, and they're very good questions. We have um, some recommendations for treatments that we have issued. Um, they're mainly for individuals who are hospitalized, who have severe disease, who are or who are critical. There's the dexamethasone. Um, there's the IL-6 blockers that have been uh, recommended. Um, and there are other therapeutics that are in the pipeline that we're looking at um, to recommend. Um, on the mild side, um, but, but on the treatments that we do recommend, the one thing I want to say is that they need to be administered by medical professionals. And it's mainly among hospitalized patients. So I'm not a medical doctor. And so I am always hesitant to talk too much about therapeutics because that's not my area of expertise. And I'm not uh, a doctor, a, a medical doctor, I'm an infectious disease epidemiologist, but I just want to highlight that of the recommended medications that therapeutics that we recommend, they need to be the right patient, the right dose and the right time. And that's why it's really critically important that medical professionals give those for mild patients, because we know the spectrum of illness for COVID-19 can range from asymptomatic, no symptoms at all. And some people never have symptoms to mildly unwell and feeling unwell. But you can ask anyone who's even had mild COVID-19 that they feel pretty rough, um, you know, for a number of a week or two, and then they recover. Uh, and then some people advance to, to need hospitalization. Um, for mild patients, it's more based on the symptoms that they have um, with paracetamol and, and different types of, you know, home type remedies to make yourself feel better, make sure you're hydrated, make sure that you eat well, make sure that you isolate from others, of course, you wear a medical mask. Um, and when we have home care, um, sorry, so before I, before I move to that, some individuals need oxygen. Oxygen is a therapeutic, it's a treatment. Um, and many people require oxygen, medical grade oxygen. We, again, are working with partners to make sure that oxygen is distributed around the world um, and that not just the oxygen tanks, but all of the other materials that are required to be able to wear the, the oxygen. You've seen people hospitalized needing the tubes to, to, to be able to administer that medical grade oxygen. In terms of home care, um, we have issued guidance. And in fact, we issued guidance really early on in the pandemic around home care. That's been revised over the course of, of the last 20 months or so, because not everybody can be treated in a medical facility. So if you are, uh, if you don't have an underlying condition, or if you're of a younger age, and you have a mild disease, you can be cared for at home. But you have to make sure that you don't pass the virus to others. 
So making sure that, that the individual is isolated, if possible, in a separate room with bathroom. I mean, most of the world does not have a separate bedroom and bathroom for, for you know, single people in a, in a home because many people have lots of people that live in the same uh, home or, or, or compound. Um, and it's about, you know, making sure you have fluids, um, food, that they're cared for, they're looked after every day, and to look for warning signs should they, you know, have shortness of breath, um, you know, should they be disoriented to need to seek that medical care. Um, and if you are cared for at home, contact your medical provider by phone or, or through telemedicine or whatnot. So we have a lot of advice out about med about home care. We have lots of infographics about how to do that. Um, and, and I would advise you to look at what those materials are and reach out because it's hard to give very specific advice on this. Thank you, Maria. Here's one very specific question coming from a viewer on Facebook who is in Boston. How risky is to be hospitalized for major surgery this fall, even if you have been vaccinated? So this is more about other essential health services that people need. But mm -hmm. again, uh, how to assess the risk of whether to, to do surgery or not in, in this moment of a pandemic? So that's a, that's a good question as well. I mean, there's been a lot of disrupt disruption to other medical services over the course of the pandemic. Um, and, and many have worked really hard to get those essential um, services back online, including surgeries um, that are needed. So in, in the situation of the question, you know, I would go by the, the recommendations of the hospital. So many hospitals have put in place um, these provisions around the safe, um, to, to be able to carry this out safely. So in the hospital, you know, you will, there will be recommendations around masks uh, in that hospital. There will be recommendations about where you can go within that hospital. So whether there's a COVID ward and perhaps the surgery that, that you will have will be in a different part of that hospital. You'll likely have to have a test before you go into that hospital to determine if you have COVID or not. Um, and so there's a lot of things that would be in place to ensure that this could be done as safely as possible because it depends on the surgery that's needed, you know, and to balance that risk, but it depends on where you live. And, you know, this is a good opportunity to thank all of our health workers, all of our medical professionals that are working really hard, not only on COVID-19, but also to ensure that other services continue because, you know, this other medical services have to continue because there are people that can die from other illnesses. And we not only want to save people's lives for COVID-19, but we want to save people's lives from other things where they can be saved. So it's important that these services get back online. We are seeing improvements of essential medical services getting back online. We've done some surveys um, over the last couple of months and, and it is improving, but there's still a long way to go. Thank you so much, Maria. Um, before we close, um, you've been talking about the tools we have in hand to not only protect ourselves, but also protect others who may need some uh, serious health interventions uh, like, like surgery is. Um, but you mentioned as well a spread of misinformation that has been following us uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. So for those who are doubting or, or are hesitant to get vaccinated or doubting the effectiveness of mask, distancing, ventilation, etc., can you please once again explain how these tools work together to keep us safe, but also our loved ones safe. Yeah, so it, it's a layering effect. You know, it, it's about a combination of factors that can keep us safe. Um, we've often said do it all, but you don't have to do everything all the time, everywhere, you know, for the rest of your life. It's about putting these, you know, doing things that will keep you and your loved ones safe. So, you know, distancing is really important right now. Um, it, it remains really important right now. Limit your contacts with others who are outside of your household. Please continue to do that. And if you do mix with others, you know, take precautions, you know, keep your distance, do it outdoors as opposed to indoors. Make sure that you have masks, make sure that you use your hand gel and clean your hands. When you are offered a vaccine, please get vaccinated. You know, there are people, you know, hundreds of millions of people around the world um, that are begging for this vaccine. There are people that are dying because they don't have access to that vaccine. Um, and they need to be used where they are being offered. Um, and if not, they need to be sent to those countries so that they can be used. We have a virus that is infecting people, that is ki that are killing people who can be saved. 
this can be prevented. And so this is something that we wholeheartedly plead to everybody to continue to keep yourself safe because it's not just about you. It's about protecting you because we want you to be safe, but it's also protecting your loved ones. Our decisions matter. What we do every single day matters. And so please keep it up. Please keep up the enthusiasm. I am very hopeful. I am, I am incredibly frustrated, but I'm very hopeful at the same time because we see time and time again that these measures work. The challenges right now, Alex, I think uh, one of the challenges is that we're exhausted. Um, the entire world is exhausted. We want this to be over. Nobody wants to think about this anymore. I'm with you. I think you are with us too, right, Alex? Definitely. But unfortunately, it's not. And the more we can come together collectively to combat this, um, the more we can keep ourselves safe, the sooner we will get to ending this acute phase of this pandemic, because we have a lot to figure out. These inequities we have to deal with. We have to, we have to build public health systems in place so that we're better prepared for that next one. We can do this. Um, if I have to be a, a global cheerleader on this, I will, because I, we see it time and time again um, that we can prevent people, you know, the, the, the severity, we can, we can prevent the mortality, we can prevent the death, and we just have to keep doing that. So stay focused, um, try to keep out the noise of that misinformation. If you have questions, ask them, you know, ask them from trusted individuals. Um, there are good sources online, but talk to your medical professionals, talk to your religious leaders, talk to your community leaders, talk to your parents, get good information and make informed decisions. Um, and for those of us that are answering questions, listen, listen to the concerns, understand where those concerns are coming from and work through it. Um, we may not always see eye to eye on everything and we don't have to, but what, what the advice that we are giving in this layered approach, it's about keeping you safe. And it's about, you know, getting past this uh, and ending this pandemic. Thank you so much, Maria. I think this was a very good message for the end to keep us motivated um, as well. And as, as you said, we, we have tools in our hands to use them to protect ourselves, to protect others. And also the more we use them now, the sooner we can get out of this. So thank you so much for today. I thank all our viewers from at least some countries, Australia, very late for Australia. So thank you for watching us. Germany, Nigeria, Turkey, Norway, Tanzania, Yemen, the US, India, Haiti. Thank you for watching us from Haiti. Uh, Egypt, Italy, Zambia, Mel uh, Belgium, Rwanda, Colombia, Bangladesh, Finland, Pakistan, Mali, Oman, and, and many others. Thank you for your questions. Uh, thank you for watching us. And thanks for following our advice and, and sharing it further. Can I say one more thing, Alex? I, it was a Please. perfect thing to end, but I want to say two quick things. One is you just mentioned Haiti. And so, you know, just a mm -hmm. thank you for watching from Haiti. And, and you know, we're, we're thinking of you. You know, there's so many things that are happening in the world right now. COVID-19 has solutions. COVID-19 has solutions. And I just plead with us to work together to get those solutions. And I want to say a quick happy birthday to my mom. So happy birthday, mom. Happy birthday to your mom. Uh, we hope she'll have a beautiful uh, day. Um, and while obviously, I'm sure she's going to stay safe and, and follow your advice. Um, you, were, you, you were talking in other sessions as well, how we can have safe celebrations, use the digital tools that we have in hand as well to stay connected, uh, yes. to, sh to express love and, and uh, positive uh, and good, good wishes for birthday to loved ones while we are still physically staying apart to, to stay safe. So thank you, Maria, and thanks to everyone who is, who is following our advice and, and sharing our message. Until next week, please stay safe.